Okay, if we can find our seats today, uh, we're going to get started. A couple announcements. Um, actually, the important announcements are um, that we have second readings of transfers into the church at the Tampa First Seventh day Adventist Church. Uh, the first would be Elliot Gusky from the Sligo Seventh day Adventist Church, Tacoma Park, Maryland. Uh, Elliot, do you hear again with us? Elliot was in first service. Elliot will also be back in the back. Uh, you can welcome Elliot along with um, our baptismal candidate, which we, we will introduce in just a bit. Also, Bryce Reddick. Is Bryce here? Okay, Bryce is not here, but Bryce is going to be transferring from Mount Calvary Seventh-day Adventist Church in Tampa, Florida. He is one of our juniors as well. So because it is the second reading, I need to have a motion to accept these uh, two individuals to be part of the Tampa First Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Anybody want to second that? Yes. Uh, all those in favor, raise your right hands. Those opposed, same sign. It's carried. You can see that there are a lot of things going on. We have Pathfinders and Adventures this afternoon. We have Best Way. Um, we do have a baptism. We'll have more baptisms on the 31st. And I can share with you, we'll also have a baby dedication on the uh, 31st as well. So um, there is a con constituency meeting. Um, actually, it's, uh, we've already selected our constituents. Um, just continue to pray um, for that constituency meeting for the Tampa Adventist Academy. Very important meeting. Um, can't stress how important it is to hear uh, what the Lord has to say and also for your prayer. So please be praying for uh, the constituency meeting of the Tampa Adventist Academy. At this time, we're going to transition a little bit, and uh, I'm going to ask um, if uh, Sierra... Where's Sierra? Is she here? I don't see Sierra here right now. I think she went in the back to get fitted. Well, okay. Um, what we'll do, um, we're, instead of having Sierra come do the interview, she has a cousin, Granville, uh, Granville Moore, and he's going to, as part of her baptism, uh, Sierra Philpotts' baptism, um, Granville's going to come forward and share with us a musical selection at this time. Thank you, Granville.
That was beautiful, wasn't it? I'm going to have you back, Granville. <laughs> He's a keeper, isn't he? <laughs> Thank you very much. I know that it was a blessing not just to you, but Sierra and the entire Philpotts family. Um, for some of you who don't know the Philpotts, if you're a, a, a relative of Sierra, do you want to stand up to say, uh, just so that we can recognize the Philpotts family? We'll have you stand up again um, as it relates to the baptism. But I just wanted you to recognize the Philpotts family. They're, they're um, really connected to us, amen? They're connected over to Mount Calvary too, but they're kind of, they have a, a path that's beaten pretty well, right, between here and Mount Calvary. And Sierra has uh, chosen, you may be seated, has chosen to um, be uh, baptized here at the, um, the Tampa First Seventh-day Adventist Church. Actually, as you can see, Pastor Claudette is going to be uh, uh, officiating the baptism. But I want to share with you just a little bit, uh, Sierra, um, just want to publicly recognize your baptism, but not just that, the vows. Now, um, William has gone through the vows with you, has he not? So what I just want to share with Sierra is a summary, and so, so that you can share with everyone what you've uh, learned in your dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. So Sierra, um, respond uh, according to uh, your heart as I share these questions with you. Uh, Sierra, do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, and do you desire to live your life in a saving relationship with Him? Yes, amen. Do you accept the teaching, uh, teachings of the Bible as expressed in the statement of fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you pledge by God's grace to live your life in harmony with these teachings? Amen. And finally, do you desire to be baptized as a public expression of your belief in Jesus, to be accepted into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and to support the church and its mission as a faithful steward by your personal influence, tithes and offerings, and a life of service? Amen. You've seen her nod. You might not have heard her voice, but she has said yes to all of these. And um, we praise God for that. And um, it, um, at this time... Um, I'm going to uh, ask Pastor Claudette if she would uh, ask God's blessing as we enter into this time of baptism. Um, join us as we pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, our loving Savior, we thank you so much that today we get to celebrate what a uh, precious, important, most amazing day for Sierra and her family, Lord. The day that she publicly gets to tell the whole world that she loves you so very much and she has loved you for a long long time but today is the day where she wants to seal that commitment through the example that you left us through baptism and she wants to say yes to you Lord as we saw her nod as, as we know that this is in her heart Father, I pray that uh, today may be a day that she will remember every single day that she knows that uh, you love her so much that you gave your only son so that he could die for her and so that she could come out of the water as a new person. Thank you, Father. Be with all of us today, and may all of us continue to support her in this decision and to pray for her as she continues in this journey. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As Pastor Claudette and Sierra get ready for the baptism, um, I'm going to ask the children to come forward and collect the children's offering. Um, our children's offering goes to Tampa Adventist Academy. And as you collect the offering, uh, my wife Julie will be doing the children's story. So collect the offering, come up and sit down, and we're looking forward to the children's story.
Thank you. Good morning. How is everyone today? Good? Are you good? Well, I'm good too. I've got a color on my mind today. Anybody want to guess what color is on my mind today? Green. Green? How did you guess? Because oh, I am wearing green. I am wearing green. And if you look at everybody in my family, they're wearing green. Even Pastor Brad is wearing green today. Now, why do you think I'm wearing green? St. Patrick's Day. It is St. Patrick's Day today. You see today? Yes, it is. <laughs> I heard, and it is. It's St. Patrick's Day. Now, St. Patrick's Day is a day where you're supposed to wear green. And what happens if you don't wear green? What happens, Malie? You get pinched. You might get pinched. Now, I'm not recommending that to anybody. Don't go pinched just because you don't see green. That's okay. As long as they can say the word green before you pinch them, then it's all right. All right. That's my new rule. <laughs> Well, St. Patrick was actually a person. Why do we have St. Patrick's Day? Anybody know why we have St. Patrick's Day? Is it just so that you can wear green and have green cookies and, and mom can put some green food coloring in your milk in the morning? No. St. Patrick was actually a person who lived a long time ago. Now, we don't know what he looked like because he lived a long, long time ago back in the 300s. Yes. And anybody want to know, guess where he was born? Uh-uh. No, he was not born in Ireland. I know, that's the guess. That's what I thought, too. He was actually born in Wales. Wales, which is near Ireland. Yeah, here's a picture. Well, let me get it so you can see in Wales. Well, Wales is, is a part of Great Britain. Yes. All right, so here's a picture of Wales. Now, he did end up in Ireland. Does anybody know how he ended up in Ireland? No, this is the bad part. This is the bad part. Let me go to the next one. He was Kid kidnapped. Kidnapped. He was kidnapped when he was 16 years old by pirates, by pirates. And he was taken as a 16-year-old boy to Ireland, and he was sold as a slave there. See, here's a picture of, of Ireland. You see, that's where he was taken. Now, what do you think he had to do when he was in Ireland? You see? He had to take care of sheep. That's right. And that's not a very easy life because they didn't let him sleep inside. He had to sleep outside the whole time. And it can be cold and wet there. And he had no pillow. You see all those rocks? He had to sleep on the rocks. It was a tough life. And if his master didn't think he worked hard enough, then he would beat poor Patrick. Do you, would you like to be a teenage boy as a slave taking care of the sheep? No, I don't think so either. Well, six years later, he escaped. So that was good. And he went back to England. He went back to England. And, well, he escaped. I'm not sure exactly how, but he got onto a boat. And actually, he says that there was, he had a dream. God gave him a vision, a dream, to, that there was a boat waiting for him. Now, all that time that he was taking care of the sheep, do you know how he got through? Do you know what he did? He prayed to God. Say that for me. Prayed to God. Prayed to God. Can you think of somebody else who prayed to God a lot when they were taking care of sheep in the Bible? Who would that have been? Let me see somebody who hasn't said anything. David. David. That's right. That's right. Well, Patrick, yes. Patrick went back to England after he had prayed to God and God had given him a way of escape. And he went back to England and then he became a missionary. 
he, be, he learned all about the Bible and how to help people, and he became a priest. And then one day, God told him, in a dream again, to go back to Ireland. Now, do you think you would want to go back to Ireland if that's where you had been a slave? I don't think so either. But he went back to Ireland, and that's, he spent the rest of his life there in Ireland ministering to people. Now, when he went to Ireland, there were not many Christians there. But by the time he died, and he died on March 17th, which is why we call it St. Patrick's Day. By the time he died, Ireland had become a Christian nation. So St. Patrick, they call him saint. The um, Catholic Church made him a saint. But he was a good man, and Patrick did wonderful things in Ireland, and he was a missionary. He came through some bad things, but he became a missionary. Now, this reminds me of a Bible verse, and I'm going to ask Adam to read that verse for me. It is from Matthew 18. Uh, wait, the, the chapter is Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Come up here, Adam, closer and read it, please. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, Read it to the kids. My authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the end of the age. Thank you, Adam. Okay, so that Bible verse says, Go and make what? Did anybody hear? Go and make disciples. Say that with me. Make disciples. That means to tell people about Jesus. Now, can we do that, boys and girls? Can we do that, boys and girls? Can we go and make disciples? Does Je yes, we can. We can do it by telling people about Jesus. So you can be a missionary. You don't have to go to Ireland. You don't have to go to Africa. You don't have to go to Zimbabwe. You don't have to go to um, Nepal. You can be a missionary here in Tampa or wherever it is that you live. So I want you to remember the story of Patrick today on St. Patrick's Day and think about how God can help you to be a missionary by simply being kind and by telling people all about Jesus and how much he loves them. Can you do that for me? Will you do that? And Jesus says, lo, I am with you always. Say that with me. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So that means Jesus will always be with you to help you. All right, let's have prayer right now. Let's bow our heads, and you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the story of St. Patrick. Help us, Lord, to trust you and pray to you and to be a missionary right here in our world. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, you may go back to your seats. Graduations are very exciting. I almost cry in every graduation. You know, uh, it's a very exciting achievement, but this is the, the greatest decision anyone could ever make. 
So as a parent, I, I can imagine the joy that the family is feeling at this time. Grandparents coming from Chicago uh, to visit, brother coming back from Andrews for this special day. And um, as Sierra and I were talking a little bit, I asked her, what's your favorite Bible verse? And this is the first time I hear this answer, and it's a, it's a great one. She said, I like them all. You know, amen. How can we not like the whole word of God, right? It's there to give us guidance, and I am so glad that at this young age, she's made that decision. Um, now, my understanding is that um, William has been her teacher for three years in the baptismal class, and uh, praise God for that. He's done a good job, and it's been clear for her that Jesus loves her. I said, what made you decide to be baptized? She said, Jesus loves me, and how can I not give my life to him? So, amen. So we're thankful for that. I do want all of you to know that the water is cold. So I want to talk more to get acclimated. No, just kidding. It is very, very cold, uh, but it'll feel good to come out into uh, the newness of life. Um, we believe as the Word of God tells us that when we go down into the water, we're buried, our, our, our old life, you know, she's young, she's she, not much of an old life here, but it's that symbol of coming back up as a new person in Jesus Christ because Jesus resurrected. You see, we're going to be celebrating Easter pretty soon, but the greatest thing about that is Jesus resurrected from the dead, and we get to resurrect when we come back out of the water. You know, we come out as a new person, as the Word of God tells us. And so at this time, I'd like to ask the family to stand and remain standing during the baptism. And I also would like the friends that want to say, Sierra, we're here to continue to encourage you in this journey. All of you who consider yourselves friends of Sierra, you are welcome to stand at this time and show her how much you love her and you want to be part of that. Good. Praise God. Good. Uh, you can remain standing for this time. You know, it's, it's something that all of us need to be, to be part of. We, we need each other in our Christian journey. And so do know that this is your church family. You have your family right here. Uh, let's come this way. No way. Okay. All right. And now, as you have shown publicly that you love Jesus, and as a minister of the gospel, I have the privilege to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As you know, it is a custom, and it's a beautiful custom in the Adventist church to not leave an opportunity to go by without asking if there's anyone that would like to follow in the example that Sierra has laid out here for us to be baptized or rebaptized, to say, Lord, maybe we've gone a different path, but we want to come back, and we want to say, uh, we accept your love, we accept your forgiveness, and we want to tell the whole world that we want to be baptized. And if that is your desire, uh, I'd like to make that invitation. Please talk to Pastor Brad, to William, to one of the elders, to myself, or fill out a card in front of you, because we definitely want all of us to have that opportunity. Join me as we pray. Father God, I thank you so much, Lord. As you've heard the prayer earlier, as Sierra and I have prayed together for this special day for her and her family. Lord, um, this is the greatest decision any of us can make. And we are so grateful, Father, that you know us, you know everything about us, and you chose to send Jesus Christ to give his life so that we could have eternal life, so that we can get out of this cold water and say, yes, I am a new person in Christ because he lives in my heart. He will never leave me nor forsake me. And I thank you, Lord, that Sierra loves you very much, that she loves your word, 
that she loves the song, Jesus Loves Me. Her parents taught her this song since she was a baby. May this be an example to all the parents out there. And this is her favorite song today. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone out there contemplating to be baptized or be baptized, that today they may seal that decision and they may choose to be baptized. Thank you, Father, and may each one of us recommit our lives to you every day. We love you, and we thank you for a gorgeous Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Two, three, there we go. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I want to start off praise and worship today with a passage from Psalms 104. It says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He makes the cloud his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. We're going to start um, praise and worship this morning by seeing how great is our God. Will you please stand? Splendor of the King, sing with us. The splendor of our King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, we see how great, how great is our God. H to H. H to H we stand. Time is in our hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God at three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great! see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names. Name above all names. Worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Worthy of all praise, my 
great thou art. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. When I was a student in academy, I had a chaplain that would say in her prayers, you know, thank you, God, for loving us. And even though, and then she would say, you know, something like, even though we're sinners or even though we don't deserve it or even though we don't love you as how you love us. And that would hit me every time. And this song, this next song that we're going to sing, Amazing Love, you know, reminds me of that. And I want everyone to just think about that, just how amazing God's love is for us. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again.
It is time to worship God in giving. In Psalms 24, verse 1, the Bible says, The earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And the deacon stand. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your faithfulness. We want to thank you for taking care of us, for giving us jobs and occupations. As we are returning what belongs to you, our tithes and offering, may you bless them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Now it's time to worship God in prayer. And I'm inviting you to bring your prayer request. Those of us who can kneel down, let's kneel down in the presence of the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being a good God. We want to thank you for your protection. We want to thank you for Jesus. And we want to thank you for eternal life. You said in your words that in the days of trouble, you will hide us in your pavilions. You will set us upon a rock, and we know that that rock is Jesus. As we are kneeling down in your presence, we want to ask you to forgive our sins, our iniquities. We want to ask you to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we are presenting our request, prayer request to you, we ask you to answer them according to your wisdom. We ask you to bless each person present today. Those, those who are not able to, to make it today, we ask you to visit them by, if you are only angels. May you be with uh, the leadership of this church. May it be uh, always under the guidance of your Holy Spirit. May you be with Pastor Brad as he's uh, about to preach. May your Holy Spirit guide him, talk through him, and may we all be edified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Amen. We all need to give thanks with a grateful heart for what he has done. Before I go into my sermon time, I just want to make sure that we, we, we follow the process that we love and enjoy. There's a baptism, right? Sierra was baptized. But now we need to uh, welcome her into the fellowship officially. You know, there's an official business that needs to happen. That means I need someone to make a motion to accept uh, Sierra Philpotts into our fellowship. I have a motion. Do I have a second? There's a lot of seconds. All those in favor, raise your right hands. Those opposed? There isn't any opposed. It's carried. Sierra, I'd like to have you come forward at the end of church and welcome everyone. That means you have to say hi to a couple people. Along with our, um, our, our also transfers into membership, um, you, um, we're going to ask you as well to, uh, to come in the back and help me out to greet the people. So we are praising God for that. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, now as we enter this time of, of your, uh, studying your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide that what I say would be what you would have me to say, that our hearts would be changed. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The title of my talk today, Sink or Swim. Can anything good come out of PSU? That would be the Penn State University. Some of you didn't know that. That's where I graduated. And uh, right now, you probably think nothing much can could come, could, could come out of Penn State University with all the press. Very negative things, very sad things. But I can say this, something good did come out of Penn State. It's at Penn State is where I found the Lord Jesus Christ. And I forget when um, I found the Lord Jesus Christ, that little church, that little small church, and the pastor there, they... They, they surrounded me, and I got so much into the Lord and into Jesus, I found that I didn't have to work to be saved, that he already did the work. And I remember calling the pastor, you know, in college, uh, our timetable's a little off. We're a little bit night owls, aren't we? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And I remember it was 1230, I lost track of time, and I called up Pastor Dale, and, and, and Dale's like, I hear the fumbling of the phone, and where's the phone? And he, well, hello, I said, hey, I was just reading Psalm 27, and, and I realized that, that the rock is Jesus. What do you think of that? Great, Brad, it's 12.30 a.m. Oh, sorry, I won't do that again. But I was so excited. And I wasn't say more than 11 months after my conversion. And by the way, I was not living a very good life at all. But 11 months after my conversion, I was still working on a couple things. Can I say that? Does that happen? Working on a couple things. God was working on a couple things. But I was so excited. I was going to church. I was going with my friend to do Bible studies. And Dale said, listen, I've heard you speak at Sabbath school. You helped out with Sabbath school. I'd like for you to go 60 miles away, 50 miles away, to Mifflin Town. And we were at State College, Pennsylvania. Mifflin, Mifflin Town was three mountain ranges away. Now, they're not the, the Rockies, but they were still the, you know, they're still the Appalachian Mountains. And I would like for you to preach at this little church. He said, me preach? They preach on Psalm 27 thing you talked to me about, 1230 a.m. I said, okay. I got in my 75 Plymouth Valiant, slant 6, 225 automatic with the air, Chrysler air conditioning. Can't kill those things. I ran that thing without water for 10 miles, and it didn't hurt it. Steel, not aluminum. <sighs> Talking about the heads on the engine. <laughs> but I remember driving up there, and I, I know that I, I, don't, I don't think I did that great. I, I just shared what was on my heart. I, I share this for those 25 people who are sitting in that small church. I probably could have preached heresy, and they would have loved me. <laughs> but I know I didn't do that. And that was a growing experience for me, that, that, that the pastor would give me an opportunity to go and preach in this little church to these people. The, the average age probably was 81 but they so much enjoyed having a young person from Penn State come and join them. And, you know, that's what I'm talking about today. This is what Jesus is going to share with us today. That, you know, God's calling us to equip and empower people to serve. That's the third leg in our journey. As, as the Tampa First Seventh-day Adventist Church, we're called to love God, right? Nurture others and equip and empower to serve. Are we doing that today? So that's our journey. We're going to be studying uh, the book of Mark, uh, chapter 3, and we're going to discover how Jesus equipped and empowered 12 pre-Christians. Do you hear me? 
12 pre-Christians to go out and preach and teach and cast out demons. And how that can apply to our lives today. So the question we're going to answer today is, who does God want us to send out? Who are those that we should, should we send out today? So the context, as we turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 3, the context is that, that Jesus was challenged about not fasting. He was challenged about how he kept the Sabbath. He was challenged about forgiving a paralytic who was led through the roof by his friends. There's challenges left and right. In fact, there was a plot between the Pharisees and the Herodians, sworn enemies, to get rid of Jesus. And so we come into our text, Mark chapter 3, verses 78. It's page 1154 in your pew Bibles, if you're following along in your Bibles. And I'm going to have the text on the screen as well as in your, in your Bibles. And this is what the Word of God shares with us, verses 78. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan around Tyre and Sidon. And so we find out that Jesus was trying to withdraw. The question is, why did Jesus withdraw? He was God. Did he have to because he was tired? Well, he took on flesh, didn't he? The question, when we're studying the Bible, it's good to ask questions, isn't it? People say, well, how do I study the Bible? Ask some questions and let God answer. Why did Jesus withdraw? I have some ideas. Maybe not all of them. I'm not exhausted. I'm not inspired. But how about this? The threats of the Jewish leaders. His time hadn't yet come, and Jesus needed to get away. That's a possibility. How about this? Jesus needed time alone with the disciples and with his Father. Jesus got tired. People pressed upon him constantly. He was having threats by the Jewish leaders. He needed to get away. He needed some solitude. How many of you need to get away? I got some hands up. Only me? How many of you feel like sometimes you need to get away? I'm not asking you to go to a monastery and be a monk. But how many of you need to get away? I'm a sanguine. I love people. You folks know that. And I have a life coach who challenged me in some spiritual disciplines that I never tried. Fasting was one that I've done before, but he said, I wanted you to try solitude. Oh, that was scary. Telling a sanguine you need solitude. <laughs> Whoa! He said, you need to spend six or seven hours away from family, away from church, away from cell phone, and just listen to the voice of God. Now, I'm also kinesthetic. Now, I haven't gotten victory over that one yet. So if I were to sit out on the beach under an umbrella, I would lose my mind and get nothing out of it. So I decided I was going to the Northwest Trail over on Sheldon Road there, right near the YMCA. Some of you know that trail, seven-mile trail. I said, I'm just going to walk. Now, I run that trail. I bike that trail. I don't know much on that trail because I'm always exhausted on that trail. And now it's going to take a nice, slow walk sit down by a bench. I even fell asleep on a bench. My son said he thought maybe, he said someone come by the police and take you away thinking you're just some hobo or something. I literally fell asleep on a bench along the trail. I saw flowers that I never saw before. I saw trails that led to little creeks that I never saw before. And all I wanted to do was listen to the voice of God. And I did that for six and a half hours. It was scary at first, but after a while, folks, I want to tell you, God spoke to me. I never did it before. And I just allowed myself, availed myself to be open to God. I got away from the cell phone. I got away from the Facebook and the texting. I got away from the email. And I know there was a chance that someone could get really ill while I was there for six and a half hours. And Pastor Claudette was on vacation. William's here and the leaders are here. But I knew that I needed time alone with God. Now I want to share with you, I spent time in the Word and in prayer before I did this. So that I was asking God to be with me. But then I just basically didn't bring a book. I just brought an openness to God. I was actually picking flowers. I don't do this. And crushing them in my hand and smelling it. Oh man, if my family knew I was doing that, I'd think I was crazy. Castle guys don't do that. But folks, it was amazing. When Jesus withdrew... He had to spend time with his father. He needed to recharge. How many of you need to recharge? 
When I was living in Dutch country, you know, you get so busy, you go down and visit the Pennsylvania, the, the Dutch, the, uh, the Amish. You just want to join them. You know, it happened every time. We'd have family coming from Georgia. What do you want to do? We want to see these Amish. They're Amish, not Amish. We're going to go see these Amish. I said, Amish, that's fine. We'll go down to see the Amish. And I sat there, and sometimes I just said, man, they're just like riding their bikes and their buggies. Sometimes I wish I was there. And maybe I wish I was there because I don't spend enough time in solitude with God. Try it. You can't do it every day. But try it. I think you would enjoy it. Why did so many people flock to Jesus? That was one of the things that we discovered. They were flocking from every region. Why? Why was he so popular, and why did they want, him to, be, want to be with him? Uh, here's some ideas. How about they la- there was a lack of genuine spiritual guidance? They had a lot of religious leaders who were speaking nothing. Empty words. They were going to the tabernacles. They were going to the synagogues. And what were they getting? A bunch of nothing. How about this? They were desperate for hope. They had no hope. Isn't this sounding familiar to you at all? Are there people out there who need hope in your neighborhoods, in this neighborhood? They're desperate for hope. They need it. Some people, plain and simple, needed to be healed. They were sick. They were lame. They, had, they were deaf. They were blind. They might have had leprosy. They needed healing. And you know when they went to the priests and they went to religious leaders, you know what they were told? You're sick because of your sin. You're sick because your mom and dad sinned and your grandparents sinned. I don't know, but you're sick because of your sin, so get out of my presence. Oh, what a tragedy that is. You know, we have an opportunity as Seventh-day Adventist Christians to be part of the ministry of healing. Do you know that? It just came out today. Oh, I was listening to National Public Radio, and all of a sudden they said, did you know that, and they start talking about red meat, can increase your risk of cancer? <laughs> I hope that's not a shock to anyone. But as seven day Adventist Christians, we've been given a health message 150 years ago of wellness. We have creation health. We have the Florida hospital system here to, sh- to, to help resource us with a message of wellness. People need to be healed, don't they? We have best way where people can learn to, to walk and, and to, to eat better in smaller portions. And they, they learn that it's not just about what you do, it's who you know, Jesus. Maybe these folks that were coming to Jesus wanted to just see the action. You know, it was a party. I mean, if you weren't even into Jesus, it was kind of fun. Seeing people healed and lepers. I mean, there were people just there for the experience of being part of the action. That's all right. There are people that come to church just for the action, just for the socialization. I'm all right with that. You know why? Because God is here. And over time, God can pierce the most stony of hearts. Turn back in your Bibles to Mark chapter 3, verses 9 to 10. Still 1154 in your pew Bibles. Mark 3, 9 to 10. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing him forward to touch him. Why did the sick push Jesus toward the water's edge to touch him? Can you imagine the scene? They were pushing him literally to the water. Why do you think they were pushing him to the water? Why? Do you ever ask that question? Literally, hey, get the boat ready, guys. I might need to hop in or I'll be neck deep in the Sea of Galilee. Maybe these people were desperate for healing. Like I said before, they're desperate for hope. They, they didn't have hope till now. They saw him healing. They were desperate, so desperate, they lost their, 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 their faculties and they're just pushing against him. Maybe they were afraid he might leave on the boat for another retreat. (laughs) You know, he did go away often. Maybe he thought he would leave and go to the other side of the lake and leave him there. They didn't want to go without touching him because even a touch can heal. Even his voice can heal. They needed Jesus desperately. How about this? He cared, and they sensed it. 
for the first time in their lives, they saw someone who really cared. What would happen if God would work so mightily in our lives, in our homes, in our marriages, in our church, that people would see that we really, truly cared? We could turn, by God's grace, this community upside down upside down. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 8 verse 12. It's not up on the screen, but it's in 1232 in your pew Bibles. John chapter 8 verse 12. The context is that Jesus forgives the woman caught in adultery. Really interesting passage. In fact, uh, we find out that the men, uh, that they're accusing her, but the, the, obviously when you commit adultery, there's more than one person, isn't there? So some question, where is the other perpetrator of this adultery? Maybe it was one of them, uh, the accusers. Maybe it was all of them. Right? All we know is that Jesus, when he was confronted with this situation, he wrote sins in the sand. I would like to say that he wrote specific sins, especially connected to the accusers. Maybe sins that were quite familiar even to the woman caught in adultery. Looking at verse 11 here, Jesus said, where are your accusers? In verse 10, Jesus said, she said, no, no one's here, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and what? Sin no more. Look at verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Don't you see that that woman caught in adultery saw Jesus as light? Don't you see that these people who are pressing against Jesus saw light like they never saw it before? God says that we are a light on the hill. Are we going to let that light shine today? Let's go back to Mark chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Mark chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, Jesus, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders, what? Not to tell others about him. Now I find this rather interesting. Even when people were demon set possessed, when the demons saw Jesus, they cried out and fled. I have some questions about this. One is, why did Jesus tell the demons to be quiet? Well, weren't they doing him a service by saying you're the son of God? It sounds good, doesn't it? Is it true? Is what they said true? Maybe his time of coronation and crucifixion had not yet come. There would be a time where Jesus would be crowned king. Remember the, 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 the triumphal entry, right? Where he rode on, on the, 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 full, the, the donkey, the, the, the one that was never ridden. They put palm branches down. They sang hosannas. But not too long after that, what happened? They got disenfranchised and he was crucified. His time hadn't yet come. And even though the demons were saying the right things... Could they possibly be saying it for the wrong reasons? Sound familiar? How about this? Oh, back, sorry. I'll get it. Okay. Their good intentions are really bent on evil. You know, a lot of people have a lot of good intentions, but their motives could be very selfish. I find that in a church sometimes, where people have a lot of good ideas, yet their motives are for self-serving reasons. Have you ever seen that? It shouldn't be about you or me or anyone. It should be about God. You know, I never find in, a, in an elders meeting or a board meeting uh, uh, where people come up and say, okay, guys, I have a new idea. Let's start wife swapping. But I might hear, let's go this direction, and undercurrent is, so that I can get the glory. It's not the totally gross evil things that happen. It's those that have truth, but underpinning is selfishness. You see, the reality is that the evil spirits were saying the right things, but the wrong reasons. Folks, if we are surrendered to the Lord, we'll say the right things for what? the right reasons. Let's go back to Mark chapter 3. And now we get to the main point of what I want to share with you. All this is happening 
And we find in Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 19, Jesus does something amazing. The people are pressing him to, 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 to heal them. He's being pushed almost into the water and into the boat. And we find these words, Jesus went up on the mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boner Bonerges, Bonerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, oh, there's a good one, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Wow, this is a nice group, isn't it? What did he call them to do? He, he got them together, and he empowered them to do what? To preach, cast out demons, and to heal. Twelve pre Christian men. So why did Jesus select 12 disciples? Before we get into that, that whole analogy of who they are, why did he select 12? Good question, isn't it? Why is it 25 or why not 33 or 110? Why 12? Maybe 12 represented the 12 tribes of Israel and that's what people understood. It's possible. How about it's a manageable number? We're finding out that you can only work with so many people, and Jesus, even though he was the divine son of God, right? He could only work with a certain number. You know, he worked with 12, but he really was very, very close to how many? Three. Maybe 12 was a manageable number. Maybe it was an even number so they could go out two by two, because that's what they did. They went out two by two. I think when we go out and share, sometimes it's not a bad idea to go out in twos. Next question, why did Jesus send them out while they were still learning? Aren't you supposed to be a complete, sanctified, close to glorified Christian? You've got to be getting your ascension robe for heaven on. And then we might let you do something. So why did he send them out while they were still learning? Is there wisdom in this? How about he knew their hearts and desires? You know, there are a lot of people today. There are a lot of people today who come into the church and we kind of put them on ice. We freeze them out a little bit. Well, they're new. We'll let them just sit here and learn our ways, which is nothing sometimes. They'll, they'll get over all that passion. They'll become kind of kind of calm, just like us. We just had a baptism. Sierra was baptized today, right? We said, that's a great baptism. You know, we'll, we'll wait a couple years, and then we'll make them a leader and set them loose. No mentoring, no help. You know, when Jesus sent out the 12 pre-Christian disciples, he also had a place for them to come back and talk to him. Many times we don't really empower, we don't disciple people, and then when it's time for them to, to be released, we release them with no help and accountability. And we wonder why people get so discouraged. Folks, I'm sharing with you what Jesus says to us. Jesus is saying, hey, listen, they weren't totally there, but I'm here for them. Are you there for people? Are we there for people in discipleship? God wants to use us to work and mentor and coach people so that this world, this community, can be turned upside down. Why did Jesus send them out when they were still new? Maybe they needed to get their feet wet in ministry. How about that? I think that the time for people to serve is even before they're baptized. The time for them to serve is when they are energetic. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be the first elder in a week. But there are so many things people need to be doing. Folks, that's the whole point. Equipped and empowered to serve. Maybe Jesus sent them out because the harvest was ripe and the labors were what? Few. The labors were few. 
And you know what? He sent them out, as I shared with you before, because he was there for the wins and the losses. You know, when you go out into ministry in your neighborhoods and your workplaces and different areas, there are times where there's losses. Do you know that? Can it be discouraging at times? And Jesus was there. They came back and shared with them the good things. He came back and shared with them the things that weren't so good. So I praise God that Jesus shows us the way. Now, the, the question I have here is, well, how were they paired up? Do we know? I don't know, maybe. Here's my answer. I don't know. But I have some ideas. I think probably James and John went together. They were brothers, and they were sons of thunder. Remember when they came back and said, we were down this town, they didn't like us? Why don't you send some bolt of lightning down there to take care of all of them? Jesus said, whoa, wait a second, guys. <laughs> now I gave you a nickname. You're the sons of thunder now. Be careful when you ask Jesus. He might give you a nickname. You know, Peter and Andrew going out there. We don't know much about Andrew. We know Peter. He always acted before he spoke. And I'm sure he got up there and probably said some things. And after a while, he said, Boy, I wish I wouldn't have said that. Came back and said, Jesus, there I go again. I'm running at the mouth, and I should have thought. I didn't. I offended someone. What am I going to do? And, and, and Jesus came to Peter and said, You're all right. You're all right, Peter. And then there's Simon the Zealot. He probably slept with his sword. We don't know how many times he used a sword in his life, but probably quite a few. He was always skeptical. He was one of these conspiracy theorists. You know those conspiracy people. How many of you know about conspiracy people? <laughs> Boy, can you, there are some crazy stuff conspiracy people come up with. They start with the Kennedy assassination, and they go right on through the end of time. Man, they come up with all kinds of things, and you know, on the web, you know, the, inter the age of the internet, conspiracy has grown and grown. Some of you are conspiracy theorists, and I'm not here to condemn you. Just be careful not to be consumed with it. So there is Simon the Zealot out there with his sword looking around, preaching the gospel, waiting for someone to jump him so he could take care of business. And then there was Matthew the tax collector who gave away everything to follow Jesus, Benedict Arnold, and let's not forget Judas, who would eventually betray the Lord Jesus. He was there too. What a motley crew! How were they paired up? I don't know, but all I know is this, that Jesus sent them that out, and he was, for, with the, he was there for them when they came back. Isn't that what God's church is about, to be sent out? Isn't that our mission is to go, to go and make disciples, not stay here and wait to go. Let me share this quote with you as we're concluding here today, as we're concluding. God takes men as they are with their human elements and their character and their, their, tr their, their trains uh, and trains them for his service. If they will be dis disciplined and learn of him, they are not chosen because they are what? Perfect. They're not chosen because they're perfect, but notwithstanding their imperfections, that through the knowledge and practice of truth, through the grace of Christ, amen, do you hear that? Through the grace of Christ, they may become transformed into who? Whose image? His image. Desire of Ages, 294. He takes people where they are. To take them where he wants them to be. Are you ready to go on this journey today? As I conclude, I want to share with you that when I went to Pittsburgh, I deferred a year of medical school, never went, but I went to Pittsburgh. The, 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 the Jesus figure in my life that I was supposed to go to actually was not very nice. He was, ended up leaving his wife and kids. I was out there kind of on my own, knocking on doors in a middle, upper middle class area of Pittsburgh. It was terrible. People didn't like anyone that wasn't from Pittsburgh. Have you ever spent time in Pittsburgh? Anybody from Pittsburgh? No wonder. They all stay there. <laughs> They're born there, they live there, they die there. It's Pittsburgh. That's why there's so many Pittsburgh Steelers fans. Because if they do get out, they'll never lose their roots. They're all around. You can tell. Their whole car looks like that. But I share with you that, uh, you know, I felt so inadequate. I felt so vulnerable. I didn't have training when I was knocking on doors and giving Bible studies. But, you know, God led and after that year, I decided I wasn't going to medical school, and the Pennsylvania Conference decided to send me to seminary after that second year, and I became a pastor. Not everyone's called to be full-time pastors, but we're all called to minister. And we're all 
called to take a step out in faith. And we need to have people who are encouraging others to go out. There are so many people who need hope. There are so many people that are lost. There are so many people that are desperate for Jesus. Are you willing to go on that journey with the Lord today? Three take-home points as we conclude today. Three. I want you to, to hear those today. When God shows up, people will push to see him and find healing. Do you believe that today? When God shows up in his church, when he shows up in your life, people will push to see him and find healing. Number two, we must equip and empower people to serve the saved and the lost. Did you hear what I said? Not just the lost, but the saved, right? We are here to equip and empower people to serve the saved and the lost. And finally, God takes folks where they are only to bring them where he wants them to be. Jesus picked 12, sent them out on this journey, and he wants to send you and me. There's a world that needs Jesus. Are you willing to be a servant for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to allow God to equip and empower you? Are you willing to equip and empower others and be there for them for God's glory? Think about that as we sing our closing song, and then I'll have a, a prayer of appeal. Turn with us in your hymnals to hymn number 532, Day by Day. We'll go ahead and sing the first and second stanza. Father, we do pray that you would be with us day by day. We're all challenged with the fact that there are so many lost and hurting people out in the world, in our workplaces, our neighborhoods, even our own families and church. And Lord, you've chosen to use us. You've chosen to, for us to help disciple others. Lord, I pray that you would give us your wisdom that we wouldn't be afraid to release people to minister, that we wouldn't be afraid because you're in control and you give us wisdom. You give everyone wisdom. Lord, each one of us has an ability to reach others. Lord, we give ourselves over to you. We open ourselves up to you. I pray that you would fuel us with your Holy Spirit, that we would have the understanding, the wisdom, and the energy to go forward. We give ourselves over to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.